Hi, it's Rob Moore here. Now, this title of this episode, Losing a Billion. I hope you haven't lost a billion, but the man next to me has. <laughs> so we're going to cover in this interview with the infamous, but quite frankly, lovely and very misunderstood uh, Mr. Gerald Ratner. So hi, Gerald. Hi, Rob. Nice this is going you. to... This is, yeah, you too, Gerald. Thanks a lot. This is part two, actually. So this is going to be on the Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast. Um, we just did an interview for my podcast, Money, and uh, this is going to be on a different episode of a different podcast. We talked about Gerald's experience in making billions, losing hundreds of millions, and then making millions again. We're going to focus more on this episode on recovering from the losses and the failure and the, the concept of reinvention. So um, I believe Gerald understands the concept of reinventing yourself better than anyone I know. I mean, even sort of very famous, successful people, they may have reinvented themselves once. But really, what Gerald is the Madonna of business. And I don't know if I've ever said that before, but Madonna reinvented herself, didn't she, every sort of 10 years or so and really had a long career. And Gerald obviously had the biggest jewellery business in Europe. Uh, that went down and then he created a, a gym and built and sold that for millions. And then he created an online jewellery business and then he created um, a public speaking business. And he's done, I, I think, more than a thousand or thousands of speeches that he gets paid handsomely for. So actually, I don't know if you remember this, Gerald. Do you remember we were in Cayman Islands together and we sort of had the idea around a, a board table of the concept of reinventing yourself? Because I deal with a lot of my clients who struggle with change um, and they fear when things get disrupted. So um, I believe there is no one alive today. And if you can find me, then find me them and I'll interview them. But I believe there's no one alive today that understands reinvention more than Gerald Ratner. So, Gerald, thank you for being on the show. Pleasure, Rob. So um, in your book, The Rise and Fall and Rise Again of Gerald Ratner, which is in my top 10 favorite books I've read of all time, and I've read more than 3,000, you. you obviously tell us in detail your whole life story. Could you, for the purpose of this episode, because we're going to go deep into reinvention and failure and recovery, could you give us maybe a two or three minute version of that? from you know being the biggest jeweler in europe to losing it all to reinventing yourself again right well i've got to start with the speech there's no point in uh trying to pretend that that didn't happen so that's the first thing that i always talk about uh people tend to when they interview me try and wait a bit of time before they bring it up. but i know they're gonna they know it's gonna come out um it's like something standing in the shadow uh always ready to appear but you know you live with it in the end because it's just like a bad back or a scar on your face um you can't get rid of it you think you can you think that it'll disappear it won't so the answer is to live with it uh, and make the most of it and i've tried to turn it to my advantage in a lot of ways by publicizing new businesses um but yeah, I have to go back to that fateful day in April uh, 1991. I was asked to do a speech at the uh, Albert Hall in front of 6,000 people for the Institute of Directors annual conference. And I always turn up early for my speeches because I can't ha hate the idea of being stuck in traffic and leaving it to the last minute. Some people love doing it in the last minute. I, I'm always early for everything. So I'm two hours early. I turn up at the... You're always late, are you? <laughs> so, I, yeah, well, you've probably got busier agenda than me. So anyway, I turn up at the art hall. They say gate 11. Uh, so I turn up at gate 11, and there's a whole reception committee waiting for me there. And I thought, oh, this is a bit over the top. But there's, like, a top politician, even royalty, all standing in this line. And I'm very honoured, you know. I'm like 41 years old and no, no boy from Hendon. So I thought, what's this about? Anyway, it turns out that this reception committee wasn't for me. Uh, in fact, it was for President de Klerk, the president of South Africa, who was the main keynote speaker of the day, who appeared straight bef just before me. Um, but nevertheless, that started off on a bit of a surreal note. Um, 
and I did the speech and um, everything went well. I thought everybody laughed and it was uh, a big occasion for me and I was very relieved. But then somebody from the Daily Mirror, a journalist, came up on the way out and he said, uh, Mr. Ratner, don't you think you're making fun of your customers? So I said, well, not really. I was just making a joke about myself, really. Uh, and that was it. So that put a bit of a dampener on it. And uh, here we are talking about this now, 30 years on. And um, it's on Twitter every day when somebody screws up. And now who is it today that screwed up? I think it's BMW, that's right. But yesterday it was somebody else. Um, and they refer to me as the poster boy of failure. But I'd just like to add that the day before that speech, I had announced profits of £125 million. Uh, we had 2,500 shops, uh, the world's largest jewellery business. We were taking more money per square foot than any other retailer in Europe. I mean, that helped a bit because jewellery is small, so you can get a lot in a square foot. But nevertheless, uh, we were the darling of the stock market. Um, two years running, we were the highest performing share. So it's worth remembering that when people continually just talk about uh, that that fateful day. Um, so I did have this fantastic career. We had a wonderful business. I really enjoyed it. And... It just shows you that, uh, which we're learning now with COVID, that nothing is forever, that nobody can predict the future. Um, nobody, you know, it's good and bad. Nobody can, can believe sometimes what happens in business and in life. And I certainly um, could never have foreseen that when I walked up to the, the steps of the Albert Hall that I was going to wreck uh one of the most successful businesses in the country. But I did, <laughs> and uh, I've had to live with it for the last 30 years. I'm not complaining about it, because uh, as I said, some things, you, it makes you what you are, and I believe that I'm probably, and this might come as a bit of a surprise to you, I'm probably a happier person than I might have been without the speech, because I appreciate things now after losing everything. So you were doing, I think you said, 2 billion turnover, 125 million profit. Your stock price was 430 yeah. Yeah. pounds a share. Is that right? Yeah, the share price was £4.30, yeah. Per share. Uh, and then after your speech, it went down to 2p a share. Uh, and yet. yeah. And you'd put all of your profits and your own personal money into buying more shares. And um, what did the turnover go down to, to its lowest point when you were still in the company? Well, the Ratners went down by 25%, which in the terms of COVID, uh, which people are reporting those sort of losses now for the first time since Ratners, because it was un unprecedented to, to drop 25%. That might not seem as ridiculous amount as you might think, but that completely wipes out your profit. Um, so we were going that year for a profit of 200 million, the, the brokers were forecasting. So we probably would have made it, uh, but instead we lost uh, 100 million. So I missed that target by 300 million. Um, Samuels dropped about 15%, Ernest Jones less the more up market you went the less it went down 10 percent watch the switzerland was not affected at all uh but but um the thing that with retail business if you lose a chunk of your turnover it completely wipes out your profit and uh, that meant that we had to start closing shops as people are doing today uh, laying off staff and uh cancelling orders so suppliers were being affected as well so it had a knock-on effect, uh, not only to me, um, but to, to a lot of other people. That, as you said, once I employed more people than the Royal Navy does. So it affected a lot. Of, and that doesn't include suppliers um, and shareholders and stuff like that. So it did a, it had a huge, huge effect. One, one silly joke. Right. So a couple of things. We're going to come to um, how much you owed the bank. And we're going to come to um, exactly how that affected your life and reinvention and dealing with massive failure and recovering and getting back on the horse and being successful again. Before that, anyone who's watching the live, 
If you want it to us to answer, or Gerald really, to answer any questions, please put them in the comments. And towards the end of this episode, we will um, ask Gerald those questions and answer them. Uh, and this is going to be on the Disruptive Entrepreneur Podcast, if you're watching but don't yet follow that podcast. So, Gerald, um, how much did you owe the bank? I can remember that number. <laughs> it's quite an easy number to remember. Um, it was a billion pounds, which was um, quite a lot of money in those days. In, in, the, in the 90s, it was a billion. Yeah, 1991, it was a bit. And that came, it's worth remembering how um, it became such a huge amount of money. And that's because I bought a company in America called Kays, uh, which had 500 shops. And the cost of that acquisition was uh, $500 million. And I bought it in a rather unusual way, using a rather an instrument that w w our stockbrokers recommended, which was a convertible share issue. So the share price at the time was about £4.20. Uh, we issued the shares at above market price at £6.50 and they had a three-year window them, for them to achieve that goal. Of course, being the 80s, I didn't ask what would happen if it didn't achieve that goal. You just assumed it did because they were going up at such a rate of knots. But of course, after the speech, they went to 2p uh, and it converted to debt. And it wasn't a debt of um, the $500 million. Um, it ended up me earning the bank, uh, earning the bank a billion pounds uh, because there was a huge draconian interest penalty coupon stuck at the end of it. If you didn't, you took. I didn't read the small print when I took it out. Took out the loan, <laughs> which I always recommend people do. Uh, but it ended up me owing the bank a billion pounds. Um, so I got a phone call from Barclays Bank, and I said, "Is it about the billion?" And they said, "Yes." And uh, it turned out actually that they'd farmed that billion out into a consortium of um, 65 different banks. Uh, so um, I had to go around to every one of those banks to persuade them to keep me in business. So I've just Googled what is one billion um, in 99 worth in today's money. Uh, and apparently it's two billion at 2.28% inflation. Inflation is right. probably more. So this could be three, four, five billion in, in today's money. Any word of it is, Rob. <laughs> Still a lot of money, even in today's money. Yeah. Okay, Gerald. So um, I believe you're the king of reinvention. Uh, and you reinvented yourself from being the biggest jewelry business in Europe to launching a gym and selling it to launching an on online jewelry business to launching a speaking career, to you know being a, a, an author and creating diverse multiple income streams. So uh, what would you say are your top pointers for people in reinventing yourself? How can you reinvent yourself? Well, the thing is that if you are reinventing yourself um, because of the fact you've, your business went down or you lost your job, you're, you can't really afford um, to lose, you know, a lot of money again sort of thing. You can take a gamble in business if you're in a position like you are in or I was in, uh, and I love to do that, and that's probably what made me successful, the fact that I did have the balls, uh, even though I had 50% of the jewellery market, to cross the Atlantic uh, to America where it was a graveyard for British retailers, but still decided to go ahead with that and, and made a successor. We were one of the few people to succeed there. So I was willing to take huge risks. Um, but I think if you can avoid those risks um, when you're down on your uppers a little bit, because um, you really can't afford uh, to be kicked out of your house, which incidentally I was in the end. But um, so, so what I did, you know, with the health club um, was I sold membership before I actually uh, acquired the, the building. A lot of people said to me, well, you should do demographics and you should do surveys on whether uh, it's worth opening a club in Henley. But I thought the best way is the acid test, the proof of the pudding, is to actually sell memberships to a non-existent business. And if it was, um, if people bought the membership, then... <laughs> then obviously that's a quite a good uh, survey. And uh, that's what I did. So I sold membership before I even actually uh, acquired the building. And if I hadn't sold membership, I would have uh, walked away. So I put an advert in the paper 
offering membership, even though I didn't I hadn't even bought it. So uh, there's a lot to be said for blagging your way as long as you don't do anything illegal in the early stages of creating a business. I know somebody went along um, to Tesco's years ago and said, you know, Marks and Spencer's got this fabulous um, range of puddings uh, and posh desserts, which you can never have because you're Tesco. Uh, but Marks and Spencer, you should compete with them and I can give you this um, these puddings called Goo, which is G-U with an umlaut on the U, signifying it comes from the continent, which makes it sort of more upmarket. Fabulous packaging. Well, they didn't have any business. They didn't have anything. Uh, but they took a huge order just on the basis of a, of a sheet of paper with a nice drawing on it. And then they went away and they opened up a factory and crew and started making cakes. Um, I don't know where they got the fact that it was from Belgium from, but that really didn't matter. That's all to do with brilliant marketing. Uh, so try and um, I always say, you know, do try and sell the product before you buy it and don't try and there's an old saying that um, don't sell the bear skin before you shoot the bear. And I would go exactly the opposite of that. You know, I tend to think of the opposite of, of uh, conventional wisdom in everything that I do. I mean, when I, I don't wear glasses anymore, you might see, you might notice. Now, why do I not wear glasses? Uh, because I, I forgot them one day and I went out to the office and I was walking around. And I thought, hello, it's not so bad. Okay, I can't see as perfectly as normal, but um, I can manage without glasses. They're a pain in the neck. So since then, that was about seven years ago, I don't wear glasses anymore. Why do people wear glasses? Because bloody opticians, well, I shouldn't say op bloody opticians, because I do a lot of work for spec savers, but the <laughs> opticians tend to say to you, uh, you've got, you need glasses. So you take your their word for it and you go away and you, you wear glasses. But I'm sure that, I'm not saying this about everybody. There's a lot of people really need glasses and I don't want them all driving around having crashes. But I'm sure there must be 10% of people out there wearing glasses that they don't need them. And I was one of those. So I challenge everything. Uh, I don't accept uh, what people tell me. I used to do when I was younger, and I've learned that that's a big mistake. Right. So my next question, Gerald, is going to be about learning from failure. But I just realized I am the same age as you were when you made your speech. Oh, well, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> You're at a vulnerable age. For yeah, I need to stay at home until I'm 42, which is in right. about five weeks. I always think, Gerald, you know, because... Um, I think in some ways we're quite similar in that I'm sort of quite contrarian and quite disruptive. And I know I've said some things that are far closer to the line than what you did on your speech. I've always vehemently defended you because I feel like people took out of context what you said. Whenever people recall what you said, they always get it wrong um, because you didn't say what the media said you said. And I also realised, well, I could easily have said things a lot worse than that. So, um, you know, it always keeps me humble to the fact that this is what I love about your story, Gerald, is you're like a little warning to us all of what can happen and a, and a lesson in, I guess, humility uh, and how everything can change very, very quickly. Now, look, your full story is in the rise and fall and rise again of Gerald Ratner. So for those of you who don't know much about Gerald or his full story, because we don't want to repeat what he's already written about. I think you re I read that in 2006 in my top 10 books I've read of all time. I love it. So grab that if you want to know Gerald's full in and out story, the rise and fall and rise again. Um, so, Gerald, how do you recover from failure? How did you recover from massive failure? Give us some tips. Well, the thing is that um, if you're I, I, I believed everything that was said about me in the press and I didn't want to play anymore. I was told that I was unemployable. And I was sort of self-isolating before it was a thing. And uh, for about seven years, I was sort of uh, doing <laughs> nothing. And uh, sometimes, you know, if you're in a situation, uh, if you're, I'll give you an example. If you're in a room with a smell, uh, you don't actually smell the odour that's there unless you go out to the fresh air. You keep kidding yourself that everything's fine and everything will be all right and life's not so bad, okay, you're not going to be successful and have loads of money, but, you know, things are all right, I'm feeding my family and all that sort of stuff. So you keep kidding yourself that everything's fine when it's clearly not. And I was doing that. I was living in denial of the mess that I was in. Uh, but the credit cards were mounting up 
and uh, I was basically very unhappy, even though I was pretending I wasn't. But in my case, I was very lucky that my wife threatened to throw me out of my house, uh, which might, you might not think is very lucky, but um, she did me a favour because you sometimes need somebody to give you a kick up the arse uh, and to say that you can't go on like this in no uncertain terms. So uh, I think I'd probably still be lying in bed watching Countdown if it wasn't for her, uh, although probably it wouldn't because I wouldn't own the house anymore. <laughs> uh, but it was very, I was at a very low point. And it was a wonderful feeling when I actually got out there, albeit that I didn't want to, but I was forced out there, uh, and realised that by actually facing your demons is a lot easier than avoiding them, if that makes sense. Um, by just not looking at your bank statement, however bad your bank statement is, it's better to look at it and to deal with it. And a lot of people are not looking at their bank statements at the moment, they're just pretending. That, and you can't do that. You've got to have the, the guts to go out there and confront the issues. And when you do, they're not as difficult to surmount as you think they are. And that's what happened to me. You know, I managed to start up a new business and it was a wonderful feeling when I was working, sitting albeit in a porter cabin while they were building the gym, showing people round, were describing what it was going to be like. I was so happy doing that rather than lying in bed doing nothing. So if you are lying in bed at the moment, get out. And, uh, you can uh, make a lot of money uh, at the moment because uh, a lot of great business has started at times of recession and times of difficult. In fact, most of the big businesses have started. Um, that's why they were started by immigrants who came out with nothing. Uh, if you really are passionate about it, you really love it, you really want to succeed, you, you really will move heaven and earth to achieve your goals. And that's what I did. Thank you, Gerald. So what did you learn about yourself through failure and through reinvented success? Well, I, I learned that I was happier being successful than being an out-and-out -out failure. Uh, there is nothing worse than uh, being a failure, uh, than having debts, than uh, not succeeded. And there's nothing better than being successful and using your brain. Uh, we're put on this earth uh, to work and to um, challenge things and to compete against others. And in business, you get the best brains. I know that I'm going to be controversial, but I believe that people who are out there in business are people who actually do things rather than talk about things like politicians tend to do. Um, you've got to, you know, people that I've met that are really brilliant, um, they don't spend all their time sort of trying to convince people or talk to people. I mean, they just get on with it and they do it. And they're the best friends. And pitting yourself out against those other people and succeeding and really pushing your brain to the limit, which you can only, in my view, can only do in business. Um, and I know I'm going to be criticised for saying that, but um, I think that is the cream of society. And I think it is secretly looked upon by people, the businessmen that are successful at a higher echelon, than uh, in other areas. I mean, let's face it, politicians are not particularly uh, popular. Um, but I mean, uh, so so business is, and this is proving it in the in the COVID that the and that the economy makes the world go round. Money makes the world go round. Unfortunately, or fortunately, any way you look at it, uh, it's vital that we work, that we succeed, that entrepreneurs are encouraged. Uh, and uh, that's what's going to make for, uh, you know, a recovery, a good recovery and, and a, successful, uh, a successful life for everybody is the people that create businesses. So I couldn't hold businessmen in higher esteem than I do. And that's why I hold you in such high esteem, Rob, because you are one of the most successful businessmen that I know at the moment, um, which is fantastic. And you're doing it at the age that I was, <laughs> very young. Gerald, that's very kind of you. Um, so can anyone reinvent themselves, you know, even if their age doesn't seem to help or their circumstances or history are really hard or bad? Yeah, I think they can. I think that um, people, they always used to say that uh, if you're a great violinist, you're a terrible lover. 
Um, you can't be, you, you are often fantastically, by the way, I can't play the violin at all. But the, the thing is, if you're really good at something, um, you would be really bad at something else. That's often the case. Uh, maybe somebody who's dyslexic uh, achieves a hell of a lot because of the fact they're dyslexic. Um, so people, it's difficult. I've met lots of people that have that look the part uh, as successful people, and they're not. And then others that just think, you know, they're a complete disaster uh, and been very, very successful. I had a buyer, and the buyer is the most important thing in the retail business. It's not rocket science to tell you that the product that you're selling is everything. And, uh, you know, if you get that right, people will queue up and knock down your door to buy it. And I had a buyer who was an absolute disaster of a person. Uh, he looked terrible, um, and he always had a cigarette in his mouth. In those days, you were allowed to smoke anywhere. And he used to, I remember he used to walk around with a cup of tea in this plastic cup, and the ash used to drop in the tea, and he carried on drinking it. His personality was absolutely diabolical. Everybody, boy, was he the most fantastic buyer that ever lived. And he was worth his weight in gold because he knew what the public wanted. I don't know how he did, but he did. So don't judge a book by its cover, especially not our book, because uh, I know we've had a bit of a problem with the cover of that. <laughs> yeah, so on that note, um, our book is called Reinvent Yourself. We've done 72 versions of the cover. Yeah. We've yeah, been asking yeah. lots of opinions on social media. Um, and honestly, most people didn't like it in the early days. Actually, more and more people are liking it now, Gerald, with our later iterations. Yeah, um, it comes out to say... Somebody said about having my picture on it, it devalues the book. No, well, I, I, I thought the first version was fine, Gerald, with your picture on it. I know you were happy when we took it off. Um, but yeah, we're, um, we've got a really good cover now, which most people like. The book is coming out on December the 3rd. Uh, it's called Reinvent Yourself with Gerald Ratner, and I've co-authored it and supported Gerald in the, um, the writing of this book. In fact, I, I write a lot of, a lot of books, so um, Reinvent oh, Yourself is my... Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. very successful. But I'm hoping my book, just be my bad luck that when I do it with you, it won't be as successful as your other books, but you've been had phenomenal success with your books, deservedly. I've read most of them. Thank you. And I hope this is my most successful one. Um, but yeah, this is my 17th opportunity. It's my 18th. I'm writing three more at the moment. But this is my first book launch in quite a long time for me. So I'm expecting it to do really well. But really, it's about the value in the book. I can't think of anyone else alive who is more experienced in reinvention than Gerald, having reinvented his career at least four times. So he's very well qualified. And I think I really believe we need to not wait to be reinvented or worse, disrupted like a dinosaur or like Kodak or Xerox or Blockbuster. You know, you can be very successful, but if you don't react with the times, um, Nokia, you know, there's so many examples. And, and unfortunately, you're in a similar category, Gerald, where you were huge and then overnight you can lose everything. This is this can happen to anyone. And this is why Gerald and I are trying to put this message out at this time in light of you know, the situation with COVID and the fear and the lockdowns and the uncertainty of the leadership from government. Uh, and both Gerald and I believe that you need to reinvent yourself, not wait to be re re reinvented. You need to disrupt yourself, not wait to be disrupted. Otherwise, you'll end up losing everything. So, Gerald, how often should we reinvent ourselves? Is this a yearly thing, a decadely thing? Do you have any rules for that? Or is it just um, before someone ruins you? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm old, as I said, you know, I'm older than you by quite a lot. And I remember in the olden days that not only did you have a job for life, but you then followed your father and your grandfather into that sort of thing. You was, there was no risk. Um, and we were talking about doing this book well before COVID. We started writing it well before COVID because we could see that uh, that situation had dramatically changed and a uh, job was you're lucky if it was a job for 10 months. I think that was the average amount of time that young people were staying in a job. So um, we saw that uh, this was a very important element in business that you had to. And, and also, you know, just psychologically, if you're in a business where you're unhappy, it's like being in a marriage that you're unhappy. You've, and there's nothing worse, you know, than just sort of soldiering on 
somebody, and it's often the woman that does that in a marriage who's got more balls than the man who just decides to end it, and, and it's in everybody's interest. Um, so, you know, I do think it makes a lot of sense uh, to reinvent yourself. Uh, but a lot of people, sadly, during COVID, you know, have lost everything like I did. Um, and put, and I hope that they don't wait seven years like I did to get back on their feet. Um, and it, 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 you can reinvent yourself. You can try your luck again. You know, after I left uh, Ratner's, yes, I did have a successful health club. But people, but I haven't mentioned this to you, but I had two or three things between that, which were an absolute disaster. Uh, I, I started a factory outlet business, which was a brilliant idea, and Bista have done phenomenally well with it. And I was before Bista with it. I could see selling designer brands at knockdown prices, top designer brands, uh, end of line, because they had a problem getting rid of their, their product, and people would certainly buy designer products. And I came up with this, but it's all to do with location. And the location that I took was Tobacco Dock uh, in the East End. And and the, I got Ralph Lauren and, and Gucci and everybody come to see it, but they all said it's too close to London. So it was a disaster. I then got offered a job running a French business, uh, Cote d'Or, um, one of the largest jewellery businesses in France. But the, the management there clearly didn't want an Englishman coming over and pretended that they couldn't understand my French, which the bit was there was a bit of truth in that. It's my French was terrible, but I but I had made a big effort to learn. So I had a, these various different things uh, that failed, um, and it was only that I didn't, you know, that I did go on. That the beauty of uh, business is it doesn't matter if you fail; you can just carry on again and reinvent yourself. Um, it's like a footballer that's going through a bad uh, bumming bar, in Arsenal. He's not scoring any goals at the moment, but he's not being, he's not retiring. He will start st scoring goals. You get another chance. Um, and that's the beauty of business. If you fail, you, as long as you don't burn all your money up, just get up, dust yourself off and start all over again. I mean, uh, Sky phoned me up a few weeks ago and asked me to do a television program and I came home to my wife and said to her that I'm going to do this program for Sky on a business program. She said, don't do it. She's because you'll say something stupid and you'll wreck your new business like you wrecked your old business. She always builds me up like that. Uh, but I said, well, she said, what will you do then? You'll be watching Countdown again. I said, no, I won't. I'll just start all over again. So, you know, you just start all over again. And, uh, the most enjoyable thing that I've had, even though I was running this huge business and done lots of things, was actually starting a business from scratch, building something, creating something from nothing. It gives you a wonderful, you know, amount of satisfaction. Love it. So, uh, what advice would you give to yourself if you could talk to yourself thirty years ago before you did your speech, other than? Don't do this speech. I thought you were going to say that. Yeah. Starting from scratch, the young, energetic, hungry, maybe cocky Gerald, what advice yeah. would you give him? Well, I'd say that the uh, internet is not a panacea. You know, it doesn't have to be just because everybody else is doing it uh, that you have to do it. I tend to try and do the opposite. Uh, I try to get into a business that is unfashionable. Um, and what I was trying to do um, in Ratner's is please everybody, uh, which you can't do, as you know from suggesting the book cover, that you cannot please everybody. Everybody's got a different opinion. So in the end, it's not worth pleasing anybody. Uh, don't try and be loved by everybody. Uh, persuade them that you're doing the right thing. Uh, just get on. If you believe something, just get on and do it and ignore everybody. If you start trying to get permission, or people's opinion, um, by and large, uh, you won't get the right advice. Uh, you, Rob, have got a good gut feeling for making decisions. And I know you don't spend too much time an analysing something. If you think it's a good idea, you go for it. That's like we, why we went for this book. We didn't sort of ask anyone's advice about it. We just thought it was a good idea. So you can spend too much time, as they did over Brexit, you know, going round in circles, continually go, 
repeating the same thing. They need somebody sometimes, like a Margaret Thatcher, to just get ignore everybody, go out and do it. You know, forgiveness is easier to obtain than permission. And I never got permission for anything um, because if you ask somebody uh, for their advice, sometimes they'll give you advice not to help you, but to help them, something that suits them because um, they, 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 they want an outcome where they'll benefit, not where you'll benefit. So, you know, I know it sounds arrogant that you know best and all that sort of stuff, but there is a danger of analysing something too long and getting and doing it. If you've got a gut feeling for something, if you really feel that something's a good idea, don't let anybody put you off. Just get on with it. Um, and there's been a lot of people be in that situation after COVID because those businesses – you know, have run out of cash um, as mine did. And, uh, you know, cash is everything in a business. Uh, however clever you are, uh, you need a lot of cash to throw at it. You know, businesses eat up money. The more cash you put in, uh, the more successful you are. That's why Americans are more, on the whole more successful because they're prepared to borrow more. They're prepared to be highly geared. Everyone says, oh, you shouldn't be borrowing money. Of course you should. If you've got a good idea, borrow it to the hilt. Um, and, and, you know, you'll make a lot more money than the 5 or 6% interest that you're going to pay if, you, if you've got a good thing going for yourself. So um, just have confidence in, in what you're doing and don't let anybody put you off because there will be people trying to put you off after COVID. Thank you, Gerald. So if anyone who's watching live wants to ask Gerald a question, please put them in the comments now. I'm going to do a quick fire round. Gerald, you can take your time, but if you, you can answer them yeah. sort of fairly succinctly if you want uh, and then we'll do a few questions so right what's the best advice you can ever remember receiving gerald i think that somebody once said that business is like a a work of art that yes you have to have a vision for something like a great artist like canaletto when he painted the grand canal yes he wanted the grand canal exactly as it is but he put in tremendous detail into that painting, the buildings, the oarsmen, the gondoliers, the water, every single thing. If you look at those paintings of the great Venice things, or Rembrandt, or, they have incredible detail. Um, so business is not a question of just having a vision. Uh, it is the boring part of getting actually everything right. And I've seen my competitors uh, especially in the jewellery business, get things wrong. We always displayed our diamond rings at 42 inches from the ground because the average woman was five foot four and the trajectory of her eyes would fall at 42 inches, optimum height. It's little things like that that are important in business. And um, conversely, what's the worst advice you can ever remember receiving? Oh, um, well, when I bought H. Samuel, um, somebody said to me, uh, don't buy H. Samuel because it's a sleeping giant. Um, how can We had 130 shops and Samuel's had 450 and their shops were double their size. It was like buying a business six times their size. And they just said that, uh, how can you take on something like that? Um, and they really tried to persuade me um, not to buy it. And yet it was the best deal that I ever did. Um, so, yeah, um, there'll always be people, that, as I said before, that are going to try and uh, pee on your parade and uh, just ignore them. There's just certain people like that who will always say no to everyone. You want to buy a new car? No. You know, whatever it is, the answer is no. And be honest, Gerald, when people uh, want to rain on your parade like that, does that kind of motivate you to want to do it even more? Absolutely. You got me there, Rob. You know me better than I know myself. I love doing the opposite of what people tell me to do. I always feel that, um, you know, if I'm just going to really annoy them by going out and just listening very carefully to what they say and then going out and doing exactly the opposite. But don't, I'm not giving anybody advice on that, but uh, that's the way I, I've always been. like to prove people wrong. Thank you, Gerald. Is there one thing that you think is really wrong with the world or business today that you'd like changed? Well, I mean, I'm an animal lover. As you know, I'm very fond of my dog. Uh, I hate what we 
treat animals in this world. I can't stand it. Um, as far as uh, business is concerned, I think that um, we don't motivate young people enough into business. We don't train them enough. Um, if you look at the standards, when shops were open, the standard of selling uh, in retail, where the staff really look at you and they don't know anything about the product because, and it's not fair to them because they've never been trained properly. We have a duty uh, to, which I know you do, and you have time for young people and you help young people. And there's loads of people when we go into the Cayman Islands and Dubai and do the mentoring that are really come from ba basic backgrounds uh, where you've taught them uh, how to deal in property, uh, all the all the nuances, all the little details, and you've seen how successful they've been. And that that there's not enough of that going around of uh, helping young people because there's so many people that are just going in completely the wrong direction. They just don't they don't have the basics. So you know, I like to help young people. I've got you know nephews and their friends and stuff like that. They always come to me. Uh, and I take time to give them advice because, you know, I saw myself at that age. For years, I was doing everything completely wrong. I mean, you might say I was doing everything wrong when I made my speech. But, you know, I was doing everything wrong and uh, I was never told the right way of doing things. And it, we've got a duty to do that, I think. I agree. I have a foundation called the Rob Moore Foundation, which helps young and underprivileged entrepreneurs start and scale their business, get a better financial education. We're doing a Young Entrepreneurs Summit, summit on... February the 6th, 2021. So um, I completely agree with you. Uh, Gerald, if there's one person alive today that if I got as a guest on The Disruptive Entrepreneur, you would stop everything you were doing other than updating your social media about how excited you were to listen to them and you'd immediately come and listen to them. Well, you know, a lot of people talk about the big names. Um, I'm less so. There's a guy called George Davis who started Next. Yes, he got kicked out. The shares went to 6p, he went a bit like me, you know, a bit over, he overborrowed and, and he was kicked out. Um, but then he went on to Asda and started George. Um, he's a bit of a difficult man. He argues a lot. He left there. <laughs> he went to Marks and Spencer's. He started Per Uno. But everything he touched turned to gold. Why? Uh, because he, he concentrates on the product. I phoned him actually last year and his secretary said he's in Austria at the moment looking at cloth. That's what he loves doing. You know, he's hands on. If you, you know, when you used to come, if you come to our office, you'll see all jewellery at uh, right, Gerald Online. Um, we don't look at balance sheets so much. It's, it's the product that is everything. And he, George Davis, really knew his product and that's why he was very successful. So I'm much more enamoured by... Um, by somebody who's a who's a, not the jack of all trades, if you like, or master of none. Somebody who really is good at their particular one particular field. Well, we might reach out to him. So thank yeah. you, Gerald. Right. So this podcast is called the Disruptive Entrepreneur. What does the word disruptive mean to you? To do exactly the opposite of what everybody else do. To just to look at a business. To look at an industry, which I did in the jewellery business because it was all very posh with chandeliers and velvet pads. And I started playing pop music and uh, put posters up and sandwich boards and didn't wear, staff didn't wear suits and stuff. Uh, and that cut threshold barrier so young people would come in. So disruptive is to, is to look at a, an industry and say it is there's a better way of doing it. as a completely different way, as, as we've, of course, we've seen in... Uh, so many different industries, all the top companies now, uh, whether it's uh, Uber or, uh, you know, any of these companies uh, have Facebook, you know, have completely, uh, and who would know the biggest publisher in the world doesn't publish anything and the biggest taxi firm in the world doesn't have uh, any cars. And uh, you could say the same for being, you know, the, so many different businesses today. So I think it's brilliant. Uh, that somebody nowadays looks at something and completely disrupts it, and often with great success. Thank you, Gerald. So we're going to do a few questions. I think I've seen a few come in, Harry. Um, uh, and remember, Reinvent Yourself, the new book, much needed by the world right now by Gerald Ratner, will be out December 3rd. And I'm very fortunate to have co-written it with Gerald, though 
Um, Gerald's definitely written more of it than me, which is why my face isn't on the cover, which people have said. <laughs> so let's have some questions, Harry. So this is from Kate Ashley Norman. I'm just reading Gerald's book now, which is called The Rise and Fall and Rise Again. So interesting how retail has changed between the 80s and now. Uh, and, and now. That original business model has been completely overhauled. Any comments on that, Gerald? Well, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that the fact that we uh, sold products that were much lower priced than anybody else is a proof that that is where to go in the UK. If you look at the successful retailers, uh, they are the low priced retailers uh, that offer value for money, which is Primark uh, and whatever you say about Sports Direct, that as well. Uh, they're the people that uh, are doing well and that's all we were about but uh, we ran a very efficient business in terms of replacing stock uh, which jewelers never did within 24 hours after it's sold because we worked out that 80 percent of all sales come from 20 percent of your lines so um, um that that's very important to keep the bet i know it sounds pretty obvious to keep the best lines always in stock and by the way that sort of all that gold jewelry that we used to sell those necklaces and bracelets has all come back in fashion now in fact the time said that if i hadn't screwed up i'd be doing very well <laughs> thank you gerald um next one harry yep. okay um hina said couldn't your one billion of debt have been written off well, it, the only way that it would have been uh, written off was, uh, you keep reminding me about this one billion, I have nightmares about it. Uh, <laughs> the only way it could have been written off is the business went would go bust. And the reason the business didn't go bust, it was too big. It should have got bust, actually, because it, it, didn't, it, it had this billion pound debt, which we couldn't pay back. But incidentally, it has been paid back now, uh, not by me. <laughs> When I left, uh, I left the debt with the company uh, as a going home present. So uh, it was paid back. But the only way a debt, uh, the bank would write off a debt today of a billion pounds. Yeah, I suppose uh, you would do. You'd go into some sort of uh, agreement with them. Uh, but we decided um, to embark on a, you know, we didn't want the banks owning the company. Um, so we we did more or less what they said. You know, when they said jump, we said so high, and they told us what shops to close and what to do. And it was a very painful, it was the worst 18 months of my life, the experience of, of going down the road. And by the way, that billion pound debt, the charges on top of that for paying it back were like another 200, 300 million pounds. Just when you a company's in difficult enough state, they charge you these banks charge you this enormous amount of money to pay back the debt. So, um, yeah, but it was paid back, and you were, and and Ratner's now called Signet is actually a three or four billion pound company today. Thank you, Joe. Next, what's the best way to entice someone into a meeting that's hard to reach? <laughs> <laughs> um, to how to persuade somebody to get into a meeting? Um, well, I think that, you know, people always want to do something that they can't do. You know, if you're a, I would, somebody once went for an interview and the person who was interviewing them said, sell me this desk. And they immediately turned around and said, I think you know the answer to this, it's sold. And then suddenly they're interested. So I think that applies to anything. Um, if you make it hard for them to uh, reach that meeting because um, there's so many limited people are doing it or it's already sold out, um, that always works. You know, when we were selling our, our memberships for the gym, we were always closing uh, the membership as limiting because we've got too many members, which we never did close, of course. <laughs> but we were always saying these are the last 50 or last 100. Uh, people just genuinely uh, rush. They, they need a push. That's why Amazon are very clever. Uh, if you look at a lot of the products, they, you know, just seven left in stock, I'll carry out five left in stock, you know. It's always this fear, which is totally ridiculous when you think about it, that you are going to miss out because you don't, you're not going to miss out on Amazon. <laughs> Thank you, Gerald. Any more, Harry? Um, Gerald, who inspires you? This is from Rob Fenlon. I think that... Uh, Rob inspires me because of the fact that he has confidence in me uh, when a lot of people didn't have confidence in me. 
Um, and, uh, you know, he's asked me to do these um, mentoring to people, which people would say, a lot of people would say, well, Joe Ratner, you know, we don't want him. He's screwed up. He's the biggest idiot that ever lived. He's a post boy for failure. Uh, but somebody like Rob did see beyond that. Uh, it didn't just go by conventional wisdom. And it actually did what I do, did the opposite of what most people do, you know, confidence. And he's written a book with me. So I've got to say that it's Rob uh, that has inspired me. And I'm not just saying that because he's, he's there, but uh, he does. And I also like another thing, the fact that he is in the business of events, or one of his businesses. I know there's a lot of strings to his bows, but one of those events was just, you think, I mean, if you look behind him, there's a picture of thousands of people sitting there, and I've been there. Uh, so you'd think that he'd be complaining and being hit. But you speak to any of his stuff, and they're absolutely positive. The morale in that business uh, that they have achieved is phenomenal, especially you know at times like this. Morale is probably the most important thing in business, and, and that's what Rob inspires with his staff and also with all the people that um, follow him everywhere. I don't know how he does it, but he does he well i can see how he does it he inspires people and that is that is a great asset that's very lovely of you to say gerald thank you i just want to share back that the reason that i love working with you and you also inspire me is because one i thought that what the press did to you was um wrong um and i think that you were taken out of context and having you know been experienced working with you i see what they didn't and your book really inspired me like i said my top 10 reads of all time the rise and fall and rise again of gerald ratner um and i like to get to know people for myself not what people say about them or you know how people comment about them on social media so uh, it's a pleasure to work with you the next year in our mentoring programs hopefully we can give you lots of speaking gigs and sell you loads of books if there's anyone on this planet i want to help make loads of money it's you gerald because yeah. I just think that your story is so inspiring because, you know, a lot of people are, oh, you know, I lost a few quid or oh, business isn't going very well. And they, they, they do sort of play their own violin a bit. Yeah. You, you lost two fucking billion. You, know? you didn't just lose a few quid yeah. and you lost everything. And yet you still rebuilt it all. And you, what, you know, you're, you're into your seventh decade of life, still with the same energy and passion, still riding on your cycle 25 miles a day, still writing books, still starting businesses. I hope I'm still doing that when I'm your age, Gerald. So um, thank you. Hey. Are there any more, Harry? Final question. Final question. So this is from Chris Hazelhurst. With a move to more internet-based selling, how long before the high street will be gone for good? And is that the best for retail customers? Good final question from Chris. Do you know something? It's going to surprise you this answer, but I actually was saying if you read if you read in the Mail on Sunday this year, I did an article saying that the high street is dead, and that uh, turn it into homes. And it, it's no point, as I said earlier, if you're in a bad marriage, you you don't carry on with it, or if you're in a bad job, you don't you leave. And to be honest with you, I cannot see any future. Uh, I think online is going to is gone up and up and up. Even before COVID, I said this, but certainly now people have got more used. There's a lot of people who would never buy anything on the internet, older generation or whatever. They're now loving it. There and it's a lot better. And I was saying that sometimes you go into shops and the staff don't know the product. If you want to buy a product online, you can find out everything about it. You can get all the reviews. You can get all the details. Go, and it's very important when you're describe when you're buying a product. If you're buying a Casio watch or something, that you know exactly how deep under the water it's waterproof for. You won't get that answer in the shop. Uh, and these are very important things, and I cannot see uh, how. Certainly not the high street. I mean, when I started, it was just the high street. Then the shopping malls opened, and then the out of town then the internet. I mean, it can't all be sustained. I think the high street is the weakest. It will go first. Um, but I do think that um, there'll be a tremendous cull um, in shops. And it won't be long before, you know, nearly everything we bought on the internet. I just can't. And it's, it's a cheaper way of getting the product to the, to the customer. So sadly, I, 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 my view is that um, the high street will be gone for good. All right, Gerald. So um, where can we follow you on social media? I think you're on LinkedIn and Twitter. Do you have your um, 
the, the links or the handles that we can follow you on? Yeah, if you go to Amazon to see the new book, although you can't order it yet, you can't pre-order it, but you can buy it, uh, which is not long now. It's next week, isn't it? Well, it's exciting. Um, you could see the author's details. Just click on me, and it's got all the details of my Facebook, how to get Facebook, um, um, Instagram, and LinkedIn especially. So they can all contact me on that. I'm looking forward to... Um, seeing you all on that so on social media which is where we're seeing everybody these days <laughs> hopefully next oh, year Gerald is very active on social media. He does reply to people. He's not one of these people that post stuff and never in the comments. So that's that's something I like about Gerald. So his first book, uh The Rise and Fall and Rise Again of Gerald Ratner, I'd grab that now. Like I said, that's in the top 10 reads and I've read over 3,000 books in in my opinion. And then December the 3rd, the brand new book, Reinvent Yourself. This is going to reinvent the world. Um, so, Gerard, once again, thanks a lot for your time. I know it's back-to-back -back interviews today. Um, I think you're fantastic. Thank you very much. Always enjoy chatting with you, Robin. Thanks for your time. Cheers.